Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Bharat Punjabi. Uh, on behalf of uh, CIRCLE, uh, the Canada-India Research Center for Learning and Engagement at the University of Guelph, I want to welcome you to our uh, India 2047 series. Uh, today's focus on the, is on the environment. Uh, my name is Bharat Punjabi. I'm a research fellow at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, I have, we have a very distinguished panel to speak about uh, you know, environmental issues in India. Uh, but before I get on with our, uh, you know, introduction, uh, which would be provided by Professor Madhur Anand, uh, who is the director of the Guelph Institute of Environmental Research, my role today is as a moderator, and I, I wish to uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Guelph uh, resides on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize this gathering place where we work and learn as home to many past, present, and future First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples. Our acknowledgement of the land is our de declaration of our collective responsibility to this place and its people, people's histories, rights, and presence. And our school, uh, the University of Guelph, supports and adds a collective voice to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee on Indian Residential School to never forget to hold governments and colonial forces to account to seek redress and healing uh, for injustice. Uh, uh, the, so today's uh, so today's uh, seminar, as I just mentioned, is on the environment, uh, and it is being hosted by Circle. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I wanted to you know uh, uh, describe Circle's activities uh, to y'all. Uh, established in February 2020, the Canada India Research Centre for Learning and Engagement is an interdisciplinary nucleus in Canada for cutting edge research on the Indi in on India and the Indian diaspora and to showcase, advocate, catalyze, and foster an equitable, respectful, and sustained exchange of knowledge between Canadian and Indian scholars on complex and emerging topics related to sustainability and social and economic well-being. I'll be sharing the link uh, to uh, Circle's website uh, uh, through the chat function soon. We also have, uh, I, I'm also going to take uh, this uh, opportunity to uh, inform you all about uh, upcoming events. Uh, Professor Bina Agarwal from the University of Manchester and uh, Mr. Vikas Swaroop uh, from the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs will be receiving honorary degrees from the University of Guelph next week. And, at, uh, and, and as we are going back uh, to in-person convocations and Circle is hosting celebratory receptions, uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, we, have, uh, we are also going to have Conversations on uh, Slumdog Millionaire with uh, Mr. Vikas Sorup, which Professor Anand and Reema Patel uh, will be hosting uh, on the 15th at the bookshelf. Uh, the last of the India 2047 series is Science in India on 6th July, same time as today. And please check our website for details. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in some or all of the events. Uh, so today's event, uh, as you know, and if you've been through the bios of our uh, panelists, uh, is uh, is one of our really you know interesting events given the kind of relevance of the environmental issues uh, with uh, and and due to climate change, uh, uh, all our three panelists have a mix of you know policy, academic, and activists experience as activists uh, in the environmental sphere in India, and that informs their work greatly. And you know as someone who works on urban environments, I've followed their work uh, very closely. Uh, th all these three speakers are no more than 15 minutes each, and uh, then about we'll be leaving about 25 to 30 minutes for question and answers. We aim to finish in 50 minutes. Uh, so everyone will be on mute uh, when we have the uh, webinar and no video, and the Q question and answer session will be handled by me as the moderator. You can raise your hand, uh, click on the icon at the bottom of the screen, or you can type your questions, comments. Please keep your questions, comments uh, brief. And I'll be doing my best to relay your questions uh, to uh, to the uh, to the panelists. So uh, at this point, uh, I also wanted to share. Uh, I also wanted to tell you all that this event is being recorded, and um, I I now pass on the platform to Professor Anand uh, to give us uh, elaborate introductions to our very distinguished panelists, uh, Professor Anand. Uh, thank you, Bharat. I For some reason, my video has been disabled by the host, so hopefully that can be turned on again, but I am here. Um, so I'll just start uh, via audio. Uh, sure. So welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm, I am Mother Anand. I'm uh, serving as the current director of the Guelph 
Institute for Environmental Research. And we are so, so thrilled to uh, sponsor this, this event uh, that is being uh, uh, run by CIRCLE. Uh, the Guelph Institute for Environmental Research, or GEAR, is a, um, it's an institute that involves all of our seven colleges at the university and where we are seeking to uh, support uh, intersectional and interdisciplinary approaches to solving some of our world's most pressing environmental concerns. So I am uh, absolutely looking forward to hearing our speakers today and to sharing these with uh, our researchers working on environment across the university and, and elsewhere. Um, just gonna check in again with our hosts to see if we can start the video it would be for my video, which would be ideal. Uh, yes, there we go. Here we are. Uh, hi. Uh, so I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing the three speakers today uh, for this panel on India and the environment in 2047. Uh, our first speaker is Mabel Denzin Gergen, who is a geographer by training, and her research focuses on post colonial environmentalism, tribal indigenous theorization, anti colonial politics, and race in, and ethnicity in South Asia. Born in Sikkim, India, she has lived and worked extensively in the eastern Sikkim and western Uttarakhand and Ladakh. Himalayas. More recently, she has collaborated with scholars working on indigenous politics in North America, British Columbia, and the Navajo Nation, focusing on indigenous youth activism, infrastructure politics, and decolonial futurity. And she joins us today from Nashville. Uh, our second speaker will be Harni Nagrendra who is director of the research center and professor at the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability at Azim Premji University. Dr. Ngendra has conducted 30 years of research examining social ecological transformations in South Asia's forests and cities. Her books, including Nature in the City, Bangalore in the Past, Present and Future, and Cities and Canopies, Trees in Indian Cities, um, and she has received several awards, including the U.S. National Academy of Sciences 2009 Cozzarelli Prize and the 2013 Eleanor Ostrom Senior Scholar Award. She also writes mystery fiction set in the 1920s, Colonial Bangalore, with the first book, The Bangalore Detectives Club, published very recently in May. Welcome. And she joins us from Bangalore. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Mihir Shah, Distinguished Professor and Chair at the Water Science and Policy Program of Shiv Nadar University. Dr. Shah is a leading scholar, activist, and policymaker on water management and rural livelihoods in India. From 2009 to 2014, he was a member of the National Planning Commission, handling water resources, rural development, and decentralized governance. Uh, from 2019 to 2021, he chaired the Government of India's Committee to draft the new national water policy. For th three decades now, now, Shah has lived and worked in India's indigenous communities in the remote hinterlands of central India, forging a new paradigm of sustainable development. And he joins us today from this uh, hinterland, <laughs> um, from a small village in, uh, named uh, uh, Data, Jatta Shankar. So welcome to all our speakers and welcome also to all of our participants. And I really look forward to today's um, talks and discussion. Thank you. Uh, so Mabel, uh, you'd be going first, thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction, um, Bharat, um, and um, it's thank you uh, and Madhur uh, for the invitation to this panel. Uh, I was invited to this uh, panel to 
take stock of India's uh, journey during the past 75 years, celebrate this momentous milestone, offer a vision, a roadmap, and the work to be undertaken in the next 25 years. And I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a timer so that I don't overshoot, and I'm gonna be reading from my notes. Um, uh, here in this presentation, when it comes to indigenous rights in 2047, uh, I argue that um, indigenous youth, uh, and I focus specifically here on educated indigenous youth, uh, despite their lack of institutional power and resources offer an important vantage point, uh, given how clearly they articulate their visions for their community's futures. Uh, my talk today is based in uh, Ladakh and Sikkim in the Indian Himalayan region. Uh, both places have a high concentration of India's uh, scheduled tribe populations uh, that is constitutionally recognized uh, at tribal groups. For the purpose of this talk, I will refer to them as indigenous, uh, a category that is not recognized by the Indian state, but is still widely used among tribal and Adivasi activists and academics in India. Uh, in this talk, I consider the future of indigenous rights in India through the lens of indigenous youth, from Ladakh and Sikkim who have to contend not just with the grand geopolitical drama between India and China, but also with the drastic impacts of climate change occurring across the Himalayan region. In the Indian Himalayan region, alongside climate unpredictability, recent years have witnessed a steady escalation of geopolitical hostilities between India and China. This has raised fears and anxieties among borderland populations, uh, especially in places like Ladakh and Sikkim, where my research is based. Uh, the last few years have witnessed uh, numerous standoffs between the Indian and Chinese military. And as a still unfolding global pandemic continues to destroy lives and livelihoods across the region, for um, especially for indigenous groups, it is hard not to imagine the future of the region in apocalyptic terms. Uh, here are some kind of snippets from uh, many you know, news reports about uh, the future of the Himalayan region and uh, studies that tell us that you know, climate change will turn one third of the Himalayan peaks to bare rocks, but in, on the same time, you have this uh, geopolitical attention that is unfolding um, in, in Ladakh, it was the uh, Galwan Valley clashes in uh, Sikkim, it was the um, Doklam Valley, uh, Doklam clashes. So um, and this was something that, you know, uh, I've been keeping tabs on. It's not just Ladakh and Sikkim, there's also these tensions that are natural. So I consider all of this, both the geopolitical dimensions as well as the, uh, the climate change and the ecological precarity that young people have to contend with. So. How do indigenous youth respond to this intersection of concerns? And what might their responses tell us about the future of indigenous rights in India? I address these questions in brief, of course, by drawing on two examples from research projects based uh, in Ladakh, in Ladakh and Sikkim. Uh, the first set of young people uh, that I work with are from Sikkim, and more precisely, uh, from Zongu, uh, Sikkim. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show a map of Zongu in a bit and where it is located in Sikkim. Uh, so Zongu in North Sikkim uh, is a pre-colonial reserve uh, for Sikkim, uh, earmarked for Sikkim's indigenous lecture community. Since the late 2000s, uh, Zongu has been a site of a very successful anti-dam movement that was led primarily by educated young people from the reserve. My PhD research that began in 2010, and that was building on my master's research uh, in TIS uh, that I did in 2008, uh, studied how Lepcha youth involved in anti-dam activism understood their relationship to their land and community in the face of heightened ecological and economic precarity. In addition to these dams, um, in 2011, there was a 6.9 magnitude earthquake near Zongu and under two under construction, under, uh, under construction hydropower projects. Uh, and people started connecting earthquakes and hydropower projects and this infrastructure development there. Disastrous hydropower in the Himalayan region, particularly in Sikkim, uh, where earthquakes and landslides are, are very common, uh, threaten regional ecology, along with visions of sustainable livelihood opportunities like ecotourism that many of the young people from Songu uh, talked about as, as a future opportunity for them. Uh, in Ladakh, 
uh, these are uh, my project is with young people who are college students who left Ladakh due to the lack of educational infrastructure. Most of these young people were studying in major Indian cities, but some were also studying abroad uh, in the US with the help of fellowships. Uh, I don't have time to get into what happened in 2019 after Article 370, uh, 370 was revoked and uh, Ladakh became a Union Territory, but I'm happy to talk about that later in Q&A. So in Ladakh, it is uh, the lack of political econ uh, autonomy uh, that is understood as the primary reason for the region's underdevelopment. For young people, this underdevelopment translates to the lack of educational infrastructure that leaves them with no option but to leave the region for higher education. I see my research in Ladakh and Sikkim trying to make sense of two kinds of movement. On the one hand, we see an intensification of development interventions in the region that is making the region more vulnerable to climate change. On the other hand, we find growing number of young people leaving the region for metropolitan Indian cities due to the lack of education and employment opportunities in the region. What unites the young people in Ladakh and Sikkim are that both these young people sit at the margins of both the, the community and the state. Since they left home for education uh, at an early age, some people leaving uh, very young for higher, uh, especially the young people from Zonggu who had to leave Zonggu to go to other parts of uh, Sikkim like Gangtok, the more urban parts to uh, study. Some of them left at a very young age. When these young people try and return and integrate into the community and express opinions on local politics or the way things should be, they're often ignored or seen as naive and have very little institutional resource of political power to enact their visions for their communities. While their visions for the future are not above critique, and many academics may not even consider these young educated people the ideal indigenous subject because of their education, uh, their familiarity with social media, English, and their social mobility. However, these young people, because of how artic these young people, because of how articulate they are, are not read as authentic indigenous voices who cannot possibly represent their community's aspiration. Uh, I argue here that this desire for authenticity re reproduces very troubling colonial tropes of tribal subjects. Um, instead, I point to how young people, even though they sit at the margins of the community and the state, offer very important uh, and crucial roadmaps and visions for the future. Here I provide two small examples from the activism and art of indigenous youth to provide a glimpse into how they imagine a future for their communities. I begin with Sikkim. Sikkim uh, was a Tibetan Buddhist monarchy ruled by the Namgyal dynasty till 1975 when it was annexed by India. Lepchas along with the Limbus are considered indigenous to the region of Sikkim, uh, which uh, Sikkim prior to British colonization included the Darjeeling district of West Bengal. The British were sympathetic towards the Lepchas, but saw them as a dying race. Um, I asked one of the young people uh, who was, um, uh, let me just uh, go back a little bit. Uh, so the, uh, the British were sympathetic to the Lepchas, but they saw them as a dying race that would be replaced by the more aggressive communities like the Nepalese and aggressive in quotes here. Uh, these are all colonial tropes of, of communities. And the Nepalese were actually, the Bali communities uh, was actually brought in by the British who encouraged them to settle in Sikkim and in the, the surrounding uh, region to work on tea and cardamom plantations. Lepchas were labeled as a vanishing tribe by European missionaries and ethnographers who arrived with the British in 1816. This is still a widely popular understanding even among many Lepchas. However, for the Lepcha youth involved in the anti-dam movement, it was impo important to counter this understanding. In the early days of the anti-dam movement, I was I asked one of the young people who was supporting the anti-dam uh, uh, struggle what he thought of the vanishing tribe label. Tashi, a college student and anti-dam activist, was critical of this discourse of the vanishing tribe and asserted that, I think this vanishing, tri uh, vanishing brand is given to, make, given to us to make us feel weaker because people succumb very easily when they feel they're inferior. He further argued that the presence of Lepcha is not only in Sikkim, but in West Bengal and even in Bhutan and Nepal, one could not say that their tribe was vanishing. And here's a map uh, that is built, taken from oral histories of the Lepcha community uh, that imagines the actual, uh, the territorial kind of the, uh, uh, range of the Lepcha community. 
In this way, Lepcha youth assert ties to the land, but in doing so, exceed the territorial boundaries of the Indian state. That points to how the process of nation building has often led to the reduction of indigenous territories and often place them at these geopo this uh, intersection of these geopolitical tensions between these, uh, these uh, China and India in this case. In Himalayan states where conservation and biodiversity pro programs often take precedence over indigenous access and use of their own lands, even within the nation state boundaries, indigenous rights have been severely restricted. However, we still find communities like the Lepchas pushing back. The anti-dam protests not only resulted in the cancellation of four out of seven dams within, planned within Zonggu, it also led to a cultural revival, leading many Lepcha youth to show interest in their language and other facets of their cultural heritage. Okay, now on to Ladakh. Much like Sikkim, Ladakh is a former Tibetan Buddhist kingdom. Ladakh was invaded by the Dogra army in the 19th century and incorporated into the princely state of GNK, which then became part of India in 1947, of course, not without controversy. Both British and um, uh, Dogra officials uh, cast Ladakhis as primitive, superstitious, and immoral. An illustrative quote here uh, that no doubt uh, draws on pre-circulating colonial tropes of native groups. British colonial officials, officials and their local Indian appointees uh, saw Ladakh as remote, backward, as a remote and a backward place in need of upliftment and integration, and Ladakh as, quote, incapable, Ladakhis as, quote, uh, incapable of participating in decisions about their own future. The Ladakhi youth I work with push back against these tropes of backwardness through their art. In the following art piece that is titled Mountains of the True Ancestors, you can read the description for more details. We get a glimpse of how young people um, reiterate their connections to the land and the ancient history of the region. In this case, through the, their understanding of deep time. This image um, is an art installation by uh, Chemet Dorji, a Ladakhi artist, uh, that imagines Ladakh um, in, its, uh, uh, in its geological past when it was uh, under the ocean. So it uh, thinks of this uh, idea of how the Himalayan region rose above, uh, rose slowly, um, and how uh, for the Laki people, the mountains are their true uh, ancestors. So in this art piece, uh, Chemeth has used um, petroliquips that are scattered in different parts of Ladakh. And here, um, um, the use of uh, petroglyphs as evidence of their prehistoric connection to the land offers a way of seeing in the, the landscape, not just as a resource, but as an archive of indigenous heritage. In both Ladakh, um, in both Ladakh and Sikkim, we find young people reaching back in time to draw and reassert the ancestral ties to land and the region more broadly. In doing so, they push back against widespread notions that indigenous communities in the Himalayan region and India more broadly will not survive the onslaught of development and modernization. Both Ladakh and uh, Sikkim had similar histories in that they were both Tibetan Buddhist monarchies. Today, both regions are seen as exotic, beautiful touristy sites, but the place and its people are simultaneously understood to be backwards in relation to the rest of the country. Young people in both contexts articulate a vision of the future where they will have a greater say in centralized forms of decision making and governance uh, that currently exclude them and their communities. Um, hopefully, through these two examples, what I've tried to demonstrate is that young people uh, are important political actors, but we won't find their contributions if we look only in institutional or official spaces since they are not invited in. But listening to their demands, desires, and visions of the future opens up a roadmap of the future, but not with one path, but many paths that are yet to be determined. I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gurgan, for a very, very insightful lecture on a very important part of India. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have uh, I have many questions on uh, your talk, and I'm sure there are going to be other questions as well. On that note, uh, let me uh, uh, welcome Dr. Nagendra, Harini Nagendra from Azim Premji uh, University, who's going to talk about uh, in the future of Indian cities. Uh, the title of her talk is India's Cities in 2047, Climate Smart or Ecologically 
foolish, you know, given uh, that our work has been on uh, Bangalore, but also other Indian cities. Uh, Professor Nagendra is going to, uh, you know, provide us with a vision of, you know, what India cities are going to be like uh, in the in the future. Thank you. Harini. Thank you. It's a pleasure to do this, and it's a hard task to follow on uh, Mabel's wonderful talk, but I'll try. Uh, let me just share screen. Give me a second, please. Yes, okay. So I'll keep an eye on my time too. But uh, so this is, I just want to start with a bit of a background on why, in, why India and uh, why Indian cities. Because uh, one of the things we always hear about India is that it's a predominantly rural uh, landscape. And yes, that's true. Various projections say that uh, the world will be 75% urban by 2050. And here's a UN World Urbanization Prospects uh, map from 2014. And what you can clearly see is that the reds and the yellows, which is the fastest growing cities, are all in the global south. And India definitely has a very large fraction of these, along with uh, Nigeria and China. India will uh, account for 35% of the urbanization that will occur by 2047 or 2050 thereabouts. But urbanization in contexts like India and Nigeria in the global south is, is really very different from the global north. And in many ways, as I'll show, uh, if you look at this, for instance, it's a nightlight satellite image. You can see India, South Asia, actually. And you can see the US and pinkish shrinking cities and blue are growing cities. And you can really see that most parts of South Asia have growing cities. And very large sections of uh, North America actually have shrinking cities. As we know well, much of Europe actually has a problem of shrinking cities, definitely large parts of Eastern Europe. And uh, you know, so the kinds of context we are talking about when you think of Indian cities, India already has three of the world's 10 largest cities. It also has three of the world's 10 fastest growing cities. And the kinds of population uh, densities, the rural urban uh, connections, the hinterland impacts of urbanization, they really mean that we need to start, when we start looking at India's sustainability in 2047, we have to take cities into very important account because, and we have not done that sufficiently at a national scale because our predominant imagination of India is so much as a rural city, a rural country. And uh, why, what, what is different about places in the global south, cities in the global south? It's not just that they have higher urban growth now. So this is uh, from a study we did of cities across the world. And what we can show is, if you look at the green, which is cities in the global south, uh, this is a box and whisker plot. You can see that green always has a higher um, uh, percentage growth of population than blue, which means that global south cities have always been doing faster. They're always denser. They've always grown faster. They also have very different social and environmental contexts. Looking at global data, you can see that uh, whether you look at issues like um, uh, youth unemployment or under five mortality rates or rates of poverty, the percentage of slum households, access to water, polluted air. In all of these contexts, the global south is very different and there are regional differences, right? Africa is different from Asia, different from Latin America. So this sort of analysis tells us two important things. One, we need to understand the context of cities in the global south. But two, we can't paint them all with the same broad brush, which unfortunately people do, uh, saying, OK, I have a global south city. Let me just apply it to all global south cities. The context is very different from region to region. Unfortunately, if you look at for data, we also did this analysis at the same time of looking at the top 1,000 cited papers on urban sustainability in a decade, looking at 2008 to 17. And what we found was that uh, most of the papers, 70% of all the top 1,000 cited papers come from North America and Europe. Between them, they account for 70% of the papers. If you leave China out, because China has a peculiar urban context that is quite all its own, and really research on that context is, is very different from how cities grow and function in, very in other parts of the world. But let's look at global South-like context. South Africa, you have seven papers. India, you have 10, so 0.1%, and other section regions of the global south, 27 So what does this mean? This really means we are trying to look at how to manage Indian cities on challenges of urban sustainability using academic literature of which 0.1% comes from India. And that's why theories like smart cities, which are developed for Western context, which fit maybe Western cities uh, if they do, 
better than at least definitely better than Indian cortex get taken and applied whole scale while methods of inquiry get taken and applied whole scale to cities like Indian cities. So we really need a lot of research on urban sustainability context in India if you want to understand how to configure Indian cities in a better way to make them to think of them as really social ecological systems which function as cohesive poles where people have a different imagination that of city building that is not based on skyscrapers or in or for instance Bangalore being another Singapore but uh, tries to look at Indian cities as following a uniquely Indian imagination and one that is grounded in the Indian social ecological context and that makes India sustainable. This is a challenge, it's not easy by any means. By 2050, 2047, take whichever year you want, India will have 60% of its population living in cities. 415 million new people would have moved to cities by 2050. 1,800 people right now move to an Indian city every hour. And by 2050, 2047, uh, just three cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, will account for 100 million people. So when you're thinking at that scale, how do you even plan for a sustainable city? Is that possible? We do have climate change coming. We have biodiversity impacts. We have pollution. Uh, we see crises all around. So in the next part of my presentation, I want to do a deep dive down into one city that I have been working on for the past 15 years, my city, Bangalore. And... Uh, the red dot right at the center is Kempegowda's original Bangalore, which he founded as a market town in 1537. And uh, I've done a deep ecological history of uh, the changes in the city. If you look at this growth in the city till 2007, and of course the city has grown beyond that, in terms of administrative boundaries, it's doubled every few years. And so the doubling has um, added a much more area each time as the time period between doubling shrinks. Right? So now it's a huge city. It has about 12 million people, about 750 square kilometers. But it's an unusual old city because it has uh, ancient civilization. We know that there were megalithic stone tombs that tell us people were there in about 2000 BC thereabouts, but there was no perennial system of water. It's a dry semi-arid region and uh, where there are, um, there's no, no sources of water, it's not close to the coast. So what people did was they came in and created uh, a favorable, aspect a favorable nature of they engineered the ecosystems really to support them so they created lakes or tanks which are really rainwater harvesting structures by scooping the mud we know this from old inscriptions they cleared the jungle scooped out the mud and created uh, or deepened natural depressions in the ground which were then used to store water which supported civilization and villages and these were created not just by kings and rulers but by common people for the support of animals, cattle, birds, service of the goddess, for dharma, for themselves, for dharma, for their future generations. So it was very much a service-oriented activity to improve these lake landscapes. And they were commons landscapes. This is very important. They were landscapes that serviced agriculture, foraging, grazing, uh, cultivation of firewood. There were wood lots around these places. There were wells. It was not all homogeneous and happy times. There was a huge amount of caste labor involved in this and horrific stories of human sacrifices, sometimes forced human sacrifices of women, infants, uh, and uh, people from uh, oppressed castes. So when I say commons landscape, it's not to remove that part of the caste injustices, but it was definitely a landscape which where ecosystems were commons and for communities. And this continued till the British took over, and this is maps from 1791 when the British in the Third Anglo-Mysore War briefly held Bangor for a couple of years. Uh, you can see that there was a lot of there were a lot of water bodies, there were a lot of trees that were planted. By 1888, when it was a British area, they had many more water bodies and many more trees. So as people moved into the city, they really started planting many more trees to improve the climate, and this continued till the 1890s and creating more water bodies. But by the 1890s, this began to change. Uh, the first piped water systems came into the city. They started getting piped water from outside. This replaced local water supply. And once the local loop of dependence was lost, people stopped uh, taking care of, in, of, the, of the water bodies. And they started considering them polluted, uh, sewage filled, cesspool, uh, cesspools of uh, waste and malaria and other kinds of disorders. They started to fill in the lakes and build malls, bus stands, apartment complexes, they became valued as real estates. And uh, trees were also cut. 
So you see a lot of trees planted by 2015, only one water body remaining in the heart of the city, a few at the periphery. And uh, this is the old city, of course. At the, in the new parts of the city, you still have a lot of water bodies that are protected. And then you find trees getting cut in the tens, thousands, millions since 2010. So what does this tell us about the future of the city? The one place where we could talk about the future of a city like Bangalore is based on its civic action. And Bangalore has a very strong environmental movement, which is a public movement, which cuts across different groups of people. And one example is the steel flyover beda, which was a hashtag on Twitter, where uh, the government was planning to, the city government was planning to build a steel flyover in an area where there was no traffic uh, data that justified the existence of the flyover. Because of the social media movement and on ground protests and surveys, including um, ours, which was a very prominent survey that we did of the trees that would be affected and the impacts on climate change and pollution and heat waves, the government finally decided to pull that steel flyover. And similarly, lake restoration movements have been very widespread in the city. This is Kaikondradi Lake, a lake near my house, uh, whose uh, restoration I was part of. This is with a community group and uh, the lake now, which is extremely polluted and dry, is home to over 150 different bird species and an incredible biodiversity oasis in the heart of the city. Right. So that's on the good side. But on the flip side, the urban commons part of this is completely gone. Urban commons in the city supported food security. There, we still find in a very recent study, we found of just 200 households, they could describe 70 spe 76 species that they foraged and bought. And 47% uh, buy or use forage species and 42% would like to forage more. But the commons are being, ex being gated and protected in the city and they have no access to them. Commons are also, uh, and commons uh, as an ecosystems that are commons are important because they're very important for migrants who use them for nature worship, for mental health, for play, as you can see these children playing in, uh, below the trees, and uh, for worship and resilience of all kinds. And we found they're very important nodes of environmental place making because when migrants, wealthy or poor, come into the city, come to a restored lake or a restored urban grove and see a tree or a bird species that they recognize from their local area. For instance, a gentleman from Assam looked at migratory cranes and said that this reminds me of my uh, time at the Assam Baraj. And therefore, I now think of Bangalore as my home or someone else from Andhra Pradesh saw a neem tree and said it reminded him of his home. So these places are very important for migrants to assimilate into the city, start working on places for environmental protection and start creating areas that they can actually uh, work in to protect the city which means these lakes should be commons, but they're not. You can see a fence here to keep out the cows. Uh, you can see a, a sign here from the municipality that says flower plucking is prohibited, swimming is prohibited, damaging trees is prohibited. You can't extract anything. And you see slogans like this in movements across the city, which says that Bangalore should become Singapore and we don't have places for uh, grazers or uh, this imagination of people who are fodder collectors, grazers, fishers, who also protect the lakes in this modern city anymore. Okay. So yes, there is a place for, uh, for uh, environmentalism in Bangalore and cities like Bangalore, but what does it really mean for the future? And now a zoom out from Bangalore in the last part of my, I want to move to other cities. So for instance, if you look at the IPCC report, these stresses on urban ecosystems are not just going to be because people are cutting down trees and filling in lakes and water bodies and polluting them. Climate change is going to be a game changer. Heat stress will dramatically increase the number of uh, uh, cities affected by climate change. Uh, many of the coastal cities like Mumbai, for instance, will be flooded. Large parts of the financial capital of India, uh, the core of Mumbai will be flooded by 2050. Yet cities like Mumbai or Trivandrum go ahead with building airports on wetlands at the coast, which are going to get flooded in 20 years from now. So if that is not being climate blind and ecologically foolish, I don't know what is. So I'll conclude with one um, analysis we did of climate resilience in cities in India. And we all know that the state act this. So across India, there were state action, climate action plans, and they were devised and they have not a single one has taken off. Now there is a plan to revive them and build new state action plans. But perhaps I think the one lesson we can look at from C40 cities and movements like this across the world is that if there is any hope for climate action, it has to be done at the city's level with cities and mayors taking the lead. We do know C40 cities is active in some cities in India, whether that be a game changer or not, we don't know. But if you look at city uh, climate action plans across India, and we looked at a number of them, 
we try to analyze what kinds of uh, changes, what kind of plans they have. And they do talk about nature-based solutions, which means ecology, but it's really uh, very, it's not nuanced, it's not in the right place. For instance, they would talk about tree planting as a solution, but that tree planting could be eucalyptus on the Yamuna River bed, which is not going to be really a solution for climate change. It is largely technocratic. There is no active, almost zero active involvement of community solicitors. And I'll end with one plan, which Ahmedabad's heat action plan, which is supposed to be incredibly successful in terms of the numbers of lives it has saved, but all, it really talks only about adaptation to climate change as in getting people out of the heat and into cool areas. But Ahmedabad has water bodies, it has trees, you know, all of those should be part of the action plan because you also need to mitigate climate change. And our own research in Bangalore has shown that if you have trees planted that reduces the surface temperature of the road by as much as 35 to 40 degrees centigrade, right? Uh, so, and the, it reduces pollution, it can half suspended particulate matter levels in the city. So these nature-based solutions, ecosystems as commons need to be really a very core part of any kinds of uh, climate change adaptation. Otherwise you risk being ecologically foolish. So I'll end with one beautiful um, image that uh, an undergraduate student who was working with us as an intern, Rohit Rao drew of his version of what would be an ecologically smart city in India. You can look at the level of rich detail in this. And this is really what our cities should like look like in 2047 if we want to be uh, ecologically intelligent cities. I'll end with the two books that I have which give you more details on this. And I, I think I'm exactly out of time, so let me stop. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Harini. A very, very insightful uh, presentation and, you know, giving us a very good synoptic view of, you know, what has been done in Indian cities and what is what is coming in the future in terms of climate change action plans, etc. So very, we already have quite a few questions which I'm going to post to you in the Q&A section. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Mihish Shah, uh, Distinguished Professor at Shiv Nadar University. And someone who's actually, you know, uh, uh, had, you know, a lot of experience uh, on the field and policy and now heading a very important committee uh, for the Indian government uh, to reform uh, water governance. Uh, Professor Shah uh, will be talking on uh, a very important subject, which is the water crisis in India and what uh, the vision for water management in India would be. Uh, uh, in the future. Uh, his, the title of his talk is Water in India 2047, Drawing the Right Lessons from the Past. So, Professor Shah, uh, you can please... Uh, thank you. And see if, yeah, yeah, thank I'll you, just, Professor Shah. I'll share my screen. Sure. You can see um, and hear me properly? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the title of my talk, as uh, Bharat just told you. Um, you know, it was mentioned earlier that uh, I'm actually speaking to you from a remote tribal village in central India. And a lot of what I'm saying today is what I have learned by living and working with the people in this region over the past three decades. And the most important thing I think I have learned is that contrary to popular belief, India is actually a water abundant nation, extremely rich in the resources that nourish a sustained supply of water. Now, what are the elements of this uh, you know, abundance? The fact that India gets more than a thousand millimeters of rain every year, that the Hindu Kush Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau are a source of 10 major river systems that provide water to nearly 2 billion people in India and its neighborhood, we have richly forested catchment areas throughout the country. And we have among the largest aquifer systems in the world. It must, however, be recognized that the crisis of water is very real. It is estimated that with business as usual, if we continue to misgovern water, as I'll just describe, about half of the demand for water will already be unmet by 2030. So we don't have to wait till 2047, by 2030 already, the crisis would have reached almost you know, unimaginable proportions. Already in around 60% of India's districts, we find water tables falling or, and it can be both or either water quality issues, very serious water quality issues, 
like finding nitrate, uranium, arsenic, and fluoride. And this is, as I said, in as much as 60% of India's districts. A recent scholarly work on 55 catchment areas in the major river basins of India shows a decline in the annual runoff. And mind you, this is normalized for rain. So the decline is not because of lesser rainfall in that year. And this includes Godavari, Krishna, Mahi, Narmada, Sabarmati, and Tapi. You couldn't name you know, more significant rivers than these, especially in peninsular India. And it is projected that if this trend continues, these rivers will soon run dry. Climate change, as we've been hearing from the previous two speakers, poses major challenges because as they say, stationarity is dead, which means simply that assuming that the past is a useful indicator of the future is no longer an assumption that we can make. So we need to factor in all these important elements of the water crisis because without doing that, the conflicts over water are becoming more and more acute and more and more difficult to resolve every passing day. So this is some of the graphic presentation of what I just said. India is the world's largest user of groundwater. If you take China and the USA in number two and number three position, you add their consumption of groundwater, it is still less than what India consumes in a year. If you take the map of India, you can see clearly the really serious pockets of falling groundwater levels and quality, and this is now getting extended throughout the length and breadth of India. You take you know, a detailed study on the Mahanadi River Basin, and you see the decline in the normalized base flows over a five-year period. So what I said about so many river systems is true of Mahanadi uh, through this study we can find. And then this uh, photograph you know, actually in some ways captures the tragedy of rivers in this holy land of rivers. You know, we are the people who are supposed to think our rivers are sacred uh, spots for holy dips. And this is the site of India's second largest river, Godavari, the Ram Kund, which is the most important site for the holy dip in the Kumb, in Nashik. And this is the kind of situation they have reached in our country. In a graphic form, this is a study I had done, which was, it was actually on uh, the Punjab water syndrome, but this is a synoptic view of the kind of water crisis that India is going to face uh, well before 2047. So what is this? Is this a paradox of plenty? Is it that we have a lot of water, but then why is there a crisis? Well, the simple explanation is poor governance and management of water. We have invested US dollars 50 billion in large dam projects, but I'm leaving aside the discussion on whether these dams should have been built in the first place or not, the conflicts around these dams, the very you know, huge fact is that trillions of liters of water stored in these reservoirs are not reaching the farmers for whom this water is meant. And we have overlooked the fact that nearly two thirds of India is underlain by hard rock formations. The fact is that hard rock formations have a very low rate of groundwater recharge. And we have applied the same technology across the length and breadth of India to extract groundwater from great depths, ignoring the fact that groundwater is a shared common pool resource. Consequentially, what has happened is that what is the most important solution posed by policymakers for India's water crisis, that is borewell irrigation, has now become part of the problem itself. This is kind of a vicious infinite regress that we are finding ourselves in, in the sphere of groundwater. And if you look at the single most important factor explaining falling water tables, water quality, and even the drying up of India's rivers, it is the unbridled competitive individualistic extraction of the common pool resource that is groundwater. And what we have done, we have ignored the great diversity of India, which is our strength, but we have converted it into a problem because we find as far as groundwater extraction is concerned and the nature of the aquifers is concerned, there is this huge diversity that we find across the country and we have applied one size fitting all and that itself has created a problem of water where there need not have been one. So, what are the solutions? You know, where 
where do the solutions lie? What, what is to be done? If in 2047, we can say India will not have a water problem because I'm claiming that India is actually abundant in water resources. So the, what we have to do is to totally rejig the very foundations of our water policy. And you know, I've had the chance to um, chair important committees to push this new agenda. Well, this is what I'm sharing with you today. The first element of this complete transformation that we need is that we have to address the demand side. We have to stop obsessing with endlessly increasing supply. Whether it's a question of water, it's called a question of energy. We cannot continue on this supply side syndrome because that ultimately is a mirage. We have to leverage and not be blind to, as we have been in policy so far, we have to leverage the links between catchment areas, aquifers, rivers and water supplies. We have to adopt the principle of subsidiarity, which simply states that look for solutions to problems closest to where the problems exist on the ground and involve the people who are there, who are facing the crisis in the most brutal manner, and they can be part of the solution. We have to reform water governance by bridging the silos into which we have divided water and by adopting a transdisciplinary perspective towards water. Finally, given the context of climate change, we have to build in resilience, agility, and flexibility into our water policies. So my talk will briefly try and explain what I mean in this short slide. First, if we have to address the demand side, the most, the largest fact about water in India is that 90% of our water is going to the agriculture sector. But what people sometimes ignore is the more important fact that 80% of this irrigation is being taken by three water guzzling crops. These are wheat, rice, and sugarcane. Now, why do farmers continue to grow these crops even in water short regions? The reason is simple. Public procurement by government is focused on wheat and rice. More than 95% of India's procurement, you know, government procurement operations where they purchase the grain from the farmers is still, after 50 years of these procurement operations, it is still centered on wheat and rice. And the private mills, the sugar mills are buying sugar cane. So the solution that I'm proposing is that we introduce low water requiring millets, pulses, and oil seeds into the public procurement system and include them in our child nutrition programs. You know, India runs the largest child nutrition preschool and school programs. And if we can do that, it provides a huge demand for the farmers to actually then be incentivized to grow these crops, which are far more location specific, agroecologically appropriate for many diverse regions of this country, and simultaneously would also provide a solution to the terrible crisis of malnutrition and even diabetes that we face across the length and breadth of India. So we could actually very, very quickly solve India's water problem if we were to shift the cropping pattern towards more location specific um, crops which require much less water. We also need to move towards location specific agroecological farming. This reduces the use of chemical inputs improve soil organic carbon. You know, carbon sequestration is the kind of mantra all over the world for combating climate change. But we don't realize the most powerful way of doing that is to actually resuscitate our soil resources and which have been destroyed through the technologies employed since the Green Revolution for the last 50 years. If we improve soil structure, if we change towards a chemical free farming system, we can provide huge economies in water use I recently did a research paper on this, which shows, you know, we studied 10 states across India, the most important water consuming states of the country, the most important irrigation states of this country, and we showed huge savings in water by just a shift of about to 25% patterns away from puzzling crops towards the agroecologically appropriate crops. As far as the large dams are concerned, we need to shift towards a participatory irrigation management system. We focus on maintenance and last mile connectivity. If we have shown, actually this is a study by the Niti Ayu, 
which shows that 24 million hectares can be added to irrigated area without building a single new large dam. And this is an enormous uh, you know, potential, a low hanging fruit, which we have not tapped into. We of course avoid therefore the tragedies of human displacement and environmental destruction. And we find that this is a solution which has already been tried and tested on the ground with empowered water users associations effectively managing the water under their control. They ensure that water reaches the tail end areas of the command and farmers are willing to pay for this service which helps meet the operation and maintenance costs. So it's an entirely financially and socially sustainable. As far as groundwater is concerned, we have a huge number of groundwater structures. 40 million groundwater structures cannot be managed through a license quota per metrage. We have to, again, rely on the wisdom of the local people once they are informed about the nature of the aquifers in their areas. So location-specific participatory aquifer management, a million farmers have already shown this proof of concept on the ground in the states mentioned in this slide. What we need to do is demand side management, crop water budgeting, and groundwater recharge, which will enable us to preserve and make best use of groundwater throughout the 21st century. This last bullet is actually a um, title of a paper which was inspired by my work on groundwater management. As it says, don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Let's not become extreme environmentalists that we don't use the groundwater at all. Let's not become guzzlers of groundwater. Let's have the goose and the golden eggs because groundwater is simply the single most important natural resource that India is blessed with. For saving our rivers, it's very important to understand the critical relationship between the catchment areas. The health of a catchment area determines how healthy the river will be from where it catches its water. You know, we again speak a lot in our country about the medicinal properties of the water flowing in the Ganga River. But we forget that unless we protect the Himalayan catchments that our first speaker was speaking about earlier, we have to protect where the medicinal properties of the Ganga come from. They come from the kinds of uh, you know, rich biodiversity, which is medicinally so powerful, which is found in the catchment areas of the Ganges. And sometimes when I give this example, my younger generation students who are much more attracted towards cities like New York, when I quickly New York, because people, the city of New York to manage this water supply through an enormously long process and a difficult process of negotiation with those living in the watersheds of New York City. And once the city decided to pay for the ecosystem services provided by the people who live in the catchment areas of New York, they were able to enjoy clean and green water. So this is the kind of blue-green infrastructure, which my previous speaker was just speaking about, every city. See, we have defined infrastructure today as equivalent to cement. But we have enormous reserves of blue-green infrastructure, even in our urban areas. And this is already happening in different parts of the world. I think India needs to join and learn from these experiences. Otherwise, it will be too late for our cities. What we also need to do is to fundamentally reform water governance in India. I sometimes say that Indian governance of water suffers from three kinds of hydroschizophrenia, which means we have divided water into silos. Silos of surface water and groundwater, irrigation and drinking water, and water and wastewater. So unless we integrate our drinking water plans with source protection and regeneration, what will happen is that the huge piped water schemes into which the government of India is currently investing, they will be in real danger because the same aquifers which are going to feed this water supply system are being used for irrigation. And unless irrigation and drinking water talk to each other and work with each other in tandem, soon all these sources of water supply for domestic use will run dry because they will be taken away by irrigation. Irrigation uses disproportionately more water than domestic water. Similarly, unless the surface and groundwater professionals work together in a river basin perspective, the drying up of India's rivers will continue. And unless the water supply schemes are integrated with the wastewater treatment uh, schemes, we will continue to have 
polluted water entering the supply systems of water in the mainstream. We also must realize that water governance in India has been dominated by just two academic disciplines, that is engineering and hydrogeology. But unless we have social sciences and management, you know, there is not a single water department in India, either in the center or the states where we have a social scientist working. Unless we have social science and management, we cannot speak of the participatory approaches towards surface and groundwater management, river rejuvenation and conflict resolution, which India desperately needs. Unless we have agronomists working in water departments, we will not be able to affect the kind of changes in cropping pattern that I'm talking about and improvements in water use efficiency required to reduce the demand for water. Unless we have ecological economists, we will not be able to understand the value of the ecosystem services that we are systematically destroying by not looking at the health of our catchment areas. And without river ecologists, we will not be able to do river rejuvenation the way we need to in India. So when I think of water in India in 2047, all I can ask is the question, will we continue to refuse to learn? My claim is that India can meet all its requirements of water for domestic use, irrigation, urban areas and industry by 2047. But, but this needs that we give up our insistent refusal to learn from 75 years of experience. The new knowledge that has become available in these 75 years is also the unprecedented circumstances of the Anthropocene in which we find ourselves today. For the last 10 years, since the 12th five-year plan was drafted in 2012, the Mihir Shah Committee report in 2016, and the new national water policy of 2020, all of these documents have outlined in complete detail how a new paradigm of water management and governance needs to be adopted in India. The only question before the country is, will the people of India be able to persuade and push governments to act on these path-breaking proposals for reform? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Professor Shah, for a very, very uh, compelling uh, talk. Uh, you know, drawing from your experience as activist and researcher, and to you know, uh, uh, Professor Gurgin and Professor Nagendra for you know uh, providing us a very good synoptic view of uh, the, uh, the challenge in cities in India and the challenge in marginal environments. In fact, Professor Shah's uh, 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 talk actually brought all of these themes together. Uh, uh, on the on the on the water issue, you know, because you're in Canada, our indigenous communities consider water as life, and I'm sure that that's wisdom shared in India as well. Uh, there are there are so many questions in the chat, uh, which I'm going to try to you know uh, relay to uh, our panelists. Uh, you can feel free to weigh in as well as you can. Uh, 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 the chat box is visible to you as well. I wanted to start with a question uh, which was posed to Professor Gurgen on uh, indigenous communities uh, in the Himalayas. And, uh, uh, and the, uh, the question is about you know, how, given the kind of multinational nature of uh, countries like India uh, you know, and other countries which have indigenous populations, you know, what, is, what is really the you know, uh, potential here for involving indigenous communities in, in confronting natural resource problems? And this is a question, you know, uh, speaking about ethnicity, diversity uh, in other contexts as well in India, where, you know, uh, divisions of caste, ethnicity and class pose an obstacle to, you know, uh, collective action in local situations. So I, I, I open this question to uh, Professor Gurgan, but also to Professor Nagendra and Professor Shah, on, you know, uh, what we should do given the challenges of, uh, you know, uh, diversity in India. Uh, Professor Murgurgan, you can go first. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think it's just, uh, I, I just read through that first question. And I think there was also yeah. this question of how, um, how are indigenous groups kind of managing in the face of these like big countries like India and China that, yeah. I mean, it's also a question of scale, right? Like it feels um, almost impossible for someone like, like a small anti-dam movement or something to 
or even indigenous groups collectively to push back against something that is happening at such a you know uh, at such a large scale uh, but I think what I'm, um, what I didn't get time to get into, especially for the Lepcha community in Sikkim, uh, is, is an example of indigenous groups who have, indigenous groups have always had to negotiate their place uh, within very large kind of, you know, dominant like groups. So the Lepcha community is, this is like this small, um, uh, 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 a tribal group, uh, along with the Limbus, they're considered to be indigenous to Sikkim. Um, and the Sikkim kind of kingdom was run by uh, the Tibetan monarchy, the Namgyal dynasty. So even at that time, even for the Lavakis who had to, you know, negotiate with the, uh, the, Dogra, uh, you know, the Dogra people and the British, these negotiations are not new for indigenous communities, even though they might be a minority in terms of like their numbers. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot of history here of how these small groups have had to, uh, you know, constantly figure out how they're going to relate to uh, big groups, uh, these big uh, uh, you know, countries like India and China, um, and uh, in in terms of like um, you know uh, trying to understand what um, uh, Bharat, like, could you repeat how you frame the question about? Um, Mm -hmm. Given uh, given the sheer uh, complexity of India, the ethnic diversity of India, you know the divisions of caste and class. How mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. how uh, and marginality? You know, with a number of cities yeah. actually sourcing water from tribal areas as well. How mm -hmm. do uh, how do uh, not just you, Dr. Gergen, but this is a question to the other panelists. How do you how do you ensure uh, you know uh, collective action? You know, uh, in, mm -hmm. in in okay. the interest of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, so what I wanted to say about that is that in the Indian Himalayan region, we have uh, this form of like governance, uh, which is under asymmetric federal federalism that actually protects like the six schedule um, and a speci special constitutional protections for tribal governance. And uh, in Sikkim, Sikkim is not under the six schedule, uh, but it has um, Article 371F that does uh, protect their uh, indigenous uh, governance um, uh, structures. And what I would say is at this time, especially as we have witnessed in Kashmir uh, and Ladakh, as Article 370 has revoked, uh, it has also taken away a lot of the constitutional protections that offered, that protected tribal land uh, from being bought and sold outside of the community. And this is a fear that you find across the Northeast and Sikkim, where there are special protections for, uh, constitutional protections for tribal land and access. So I would say in, in terms of like practically in the Indian context, it's very important to protect those, um, to, uh, to ensure Sure that those protections uh, remain because there's a lot of pushback against, especially from main, uh, the mainland Indians, that these protections have spoiled this region or that they have, you know, that they restrict access and uh, that they're unconstitutional in some way. Uh, but just given the kind of violent histories of how indigenous groups have been incorporated into the Indian state, these protections have been very important for sustaining biodiversity and uh, collective forms of, of uh, living and, and, and being. Um, so just in terms of like practical, like uh, in terms of state and policy, I would say it's important to protect uh, these asymmetric uh, federalism uh, that is afforded right. in the Himalayan states. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important point. Uh, went on. Yeah, what if I can add, yeah, I can respond yeah, because I think your question is extremely important because I'm talking of participatory approaches, collective action is at the heart of those. And my simple response sometimes is to say that, look, when India became independent, you know what was said about India, that these are people who cannot govern themselves because they are divided completely on lines of region, religion, caste, what have you. And the fact is that the answer to the problems of democracy, so to speak, because that's what these are, is deeper democracy, not less democracy. And what we find through the experience of collective action is that initially these problems are there, but the way this, uh, these problems can be resolved is by empowering these bodies. So like, uh, you know, uh, Professor Gelgen was saying about a different context, I'm talking about even the heartland of India. If we actually empower the water user associations, those doing the groundwater management, then what happens is they take decisions and they resolve their conflicts because what happens in common pool resources is that they incentivize collective action. 
you know as the work of elena ostrom teaches us we will not be able to uh, you know uh, manage these resources unless people come together and even the rich and the powerful or the upper caste in different cases will suffer equally with they over exploit groundwater because that way nature is very even in the meeting out of justice as we find in climate change itself you will find everyone is going to be adversely affected of course there can be differential uh, you know rates and degrees of uh, um, the way they are affected so i think the deeper you take these democratic forms of you know collective action the more solutions you will find and the conflicts that you talk about get resolved in that process yes thank you that that's a very very insightful and hopeful uh, kind of scenario uh, uh, professor nagendra i mean given that you've also been part of activism in bangalore i know how do you how would you respond to both professor gurgin and professor shah on this question of governance you know where decentralization has taken a back seat in uh, rural india but also urban india is so what are the prospects for you know from where you are talking to us in bangalore you know what can bangalore provide us with a model maybe i would like to think so but i think it's very challenging on the ground because cities might be the hardest place to get uh, collective action to work for uh, specific reasons for instance if you look at bangalore and um, some of the things we have seen is there are well obviously much of the lake revival is driven by influential um, residents right so they might be resident welfare associations but they are usually economically wealthy educated and upper caste and so that that's one part of it one interesting thing you will see that they're often women uh, driven by women which is a very interesting part of gender and collective action in cities that we see but that said there are lakes and lake there are lake groups and lake groups and some are extremely they try uh, they have tried to be much more participatory for instance trying to work with the government to find ways to allow grazers in or work with the fisher groups to be collaborative right so on that part i think there is a lot of work to be done but there is at least hope of progress where it gets very hard is with the migrants because in the indian migrant situation especially migrant labor is so temporary you might have a set of plastic shacks near a lake where people come for 3 weeks or 3 months and then leave or they go back on weekends and they pay for a, you know to stay in a tent every day in such situations they are the ones often most affected by the lake or most affected by commons most dependent on them for water grazing um not grazing water and fuel but these are the two big uses and sanitation but they are the ones who are not around there there's no way in which they can be involved so i think this is really one going to be one of our hardest challenges in terms of right. and india will be full of migrants temporary migrants for a very long time yes yes and urban informality poses very unique challenges in uh, cities like i uh, professor john harris who's you know actually helped us bring the, together this event as well and the series as well has been ra has raised his hand for some time now and i would like uh, john to go ahead and ask his question john you can unmute yourself actually and ask your question okay um oh has the host still stopped my uh... no no I, I, am i heard Yes, 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 we can hear okay. very well. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 thanks so much. This is a, a question uh, for Professor Shah. Uh, thank you so much for a really very compelling talk. But my question uh, is, what are the prospects for India learning from experience over the next 25 years? I mean, I'm just struck by the fact that uh, some parts of what you're talking about uh, have been Uh, have been written about have been advocated for a long time i mean i think about you know what you were saying about participatory water management i mean these ideas were uh, were developed uh, and uh, you know put out uh, by robert chambers for example and others going back you know almost 50 years and there's very little sign of of there having been learning Uh, from the research and advocacy that was done 40 50 years ago i mean what are the prospects now for 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 learning given you know so little learning over over the last half century so you know john you really sort of expressed the question that i am agonizing over ever since i have been trying to lead the water reform process in india Uh, but i would uh, slightly correct you on the fact that no learning has occurred actually uh, a lot of what i said in my presentation is based on fairly large scale work 
whether it's in participatory irrigation management, groundwater management, work done in catchment area protection, you know, the watershed program. These are fairly significant initiatives that have taken place. And many of the state governments have actually pioneered these initiatives. So it would not be correct entirely to say that nothing has been learned, but okay. you're absolutely right that the scale at which this work should have happened, the investments that uh, the government of India and the state governments need to put in have still not uh, come into play. And I think uh, the answer to your question is very simple. The more the crisis on the ground is getting serious, the more water can become a political issue, if you like, an right. issue which would make or break governments, that's when we will see action on the ground at the scale that the country needs to see. Without that, and so far that has not transpired, no political party, we have been trying to actually advocate with political parties as well, that we must now give water the kind of priority it needs. And there has been a lot of movement on the ground putting pressure, but I think that pressure is still not of that cutting edge quality. If unless the citizens rise and compel governments, that's why my last statement in my presentation was that, that when will that happen? Absolutely. When that happens, the answer to your question will emerge. Without <laughs> that, I think we will continue to remain in the situation we are in today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Professor Shah. I, I given uh, that we are, you know, we just have 10 minutes I, if the panelists don't mind, I'm going to bunch the questions together and throw it at you all. Uh, a question for uh, Professor Nagendra, but you know, could also be responded to by other uh, the other two panelists. Is, you know, how uh, how do you think you know what kind of uh, contributions could better North South relations play in meeting the challenge of climate change, uh, whether in cities, but in also other environments. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other question is uh, about education, the role of education, uh, which was a highlight of Professor Gergen's uh, presentation, but also is valid to you know the kind of work Professor Shah is doing, questioning the kinds of expertise you know that are present in uh, in, in some of the water governance bodies. So what is uh, what is the role of the youth and educational institution? This question comes from Anirudh Krishna. Uh, and the question on climate change is by Professor uh, uh, Mr. Yeru Shalmi. Uh, they're both in the chat box and you could take a look at them if you, uh, I just tried to capture the essence of both these questions. Uh, Professor Shah, would you like to go at that first? Well, on education, it's uh, I think very simple in the new national water policy, actually, we have an entire section on education because water education is still mired in the colonial era. I mean, we are speaking of engineering being taught of how to construct large dams. Actually, there may not be many sites left where you can locate these in the Northeast of India, where we are trying to destroy whatever is you know, remaining of the Himalayan ecosystem. So I think what we are saying is a fundamental change in the way we do water education. And we want to start from the school curricula because you know we all, I think, Bharat, you would have also learned the water cycle. You know, There's always the diagram in the school books. Of course, our water policy makers have forgotten the water cycle diagram, but much more about this new paradigm of water management and governance has to be included in the curricula of uh, you know, water education. And that's why in the Shiv Nadar University, we started this pioneering water science and policy program, which is exactly trying to fill in that gap, but one program will not cut it. We need to do it you know, across the board. That's when actually we'll get water professionals with this transdisciplinary understanding of water. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'll continue to be dominated by the engineers. I have nothing against engineers. I'm sure many people <laughs> in this conversation are engineers, but we need the other disciplines to work with the engineers to give a holistic perspective on water. Professor Gergen. Um, yeah, so I think education, I think another question was like, um, my talking about formal schooling and yes like in the case of the Ladakhi students it is about formal education it is about higher education going to college um, but I think what young people learn is not just 
you know, sitting in college or in the classes, but through that movement between their home territories and the big cities. And one of our interests in this project was to understand how young people understand their place in India, um, especially as they face racial discrimination and they're told that they, you know, don't look like they're from India or they don't belong. So how does that affect their, uh, you know, understanding of the Indi in Indian state? So I think education here is like, a much broader kind of understanding of not just you know formal schooling, but also what young people learn when they move from one context to another, um, especially uh, young people from the Himalayan region that uh, you know maybe don't uh, know much about what uh, what's happening in, in, in Delhi and all these big cities. Um, so yeah, so expanding our understanding of uh, education, the two examples that I gave come from art and activism um, that, you know, spills beyond uh, the formal kind of boundaries of education. And in, in Sikkim, I think the context is um, there's a high rates of unemployment uh, among educated youth. Um, so there's the young people that I spoke with were educated unemployed youth. Um, and what, what I found was that there was a lot of government programming for unemployed uh, youth, uh, but there was a lot of it was directed by the central government. And I think if you're thinking about education, collective kind of action, uh, these programs need to give over some of that power to young people in these areas so that they can design and lead their own, uh, and you know, design and lead with how they are thinking about uh, uh, you know, education, how they're thinking about activism, the environment. So turning over some of the power to young people and trusting them uh, and their visions for the future. Um, yeah. Professor Nagendra, would you like to respond to that? I would maybe give two very specific examples. One is some work we've been doing with the Karnataka government, which is early stages, but there are village wooded groves or woodlots called Gundutops, which were very close to Bangalore and disappearing. So we started by with, um, we wrote a little, it's not really a graphic novel, it's not really a book, but you know, it's, it's a little book with um, a story of um, a woman who comes back to visit her grove in the, and a conversation with a tree. And it's bilingual, English on one side, Canada on the other side, with sketches by our students. Uh, so what, what what was very interesting was the Karnataka state government then wanted uh, 6,500 print copies, which we've given them for primary schools across the, the state. And with this idea that this would also be worked into the MG Endrega program so that the part of the what the state does is to actually restore some of these wooded groves or many of these wooded groves across the state. And now what we've given them is teaching booklets that a teacher can take primary school students out into these groves and then they can do the two things, you know, which, which are neither physics nor maths nor biology, which is outdoor activities that integrate all of these and also get them back into the culture. So ask your grandparents, what do they forage for? How do they cook it? So all of these, it's early days, but I think if that goes into practice, that really tells us how education can be instantiated at a very powerful level at, at a very young age. And to me, that speaks of the fact that one of the biggest challenges we have with urbanization is that children will become disconnected from nature and we will, they will have mental you know challenges because of nature deficit disorder but also how will they work on conservation or sustainability if they don't understand what it is to live with nature so we need things like this and a second quick example uh, because uh, mabel spoke about sikkim is work that the azim primji foundation recently did with the sikkim government to create a lovely set of primary school textbooks i don't know if you've seen this on this with keeping the sustainable development goals in mind which integrate Local, so for instance, all the names of the school children are local Sikkimese names. Whatever animals you have would be local, you know, domestic or uh, exotic, I mean, or uh, wild. So all of those things, trying to make a textbook which talks about sustainability development goals, which translate it to context that they can understand, which, speaking of uh, what Mihir was saying, is a very multidisciplinary way because that's how children approach things naturally, right? And so from these, I think we really need to do the the... Uh, the technical training, and I completely agree, but I think we also need to do something for very young children. And so how do we spread that gamut? Because these will be the future of the world or the, the decision makers and the leaders in the next 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nagendra. And that echoes, you know, our own context in Canada, where my students are very, very anxious about what climate change is going to do, uh, both uh, to their future, but also to their present. Uh, and uh, so on, on that note, I... Uh, I just wanted to quickly again, uh, you know, uh, thank all of you uh, uh, for, you know, uh, taking out the time to, you know, uh, give us uh, your perspective on and your vision for India's environment. Uh, I wish I could do uh, more justice uh, to, you know, some of the questions that have appeared, but, you know, uh, I, I again uh, wanted to thank also the uh, 
the uh, the audience for asking such uh, interesting questions. Uh, and uh, our next our next event uh, is going to be on uh, science in India on Wednesday, sixth July, uh, at the same time at uh, at ten p.m. Eastern. And you can sign up for this event uh, uh, on the Circle website. And if you have joined us uh, on our list, sir, we, we will send you and uh, we will send you an email, you know, inviting all of you to join our next session. Again, uh, I, I again I wanted to thank all the panelists, you know, joining us from uh, you know various parts of India, North America, and and the world, uh, and our audience for you know contributing uh, to this event and to uh, you know and also giving us, uh, as I said, some perspective on you know what India's future environmental future is going to be like. Please stay in touch. And I uh, also wanted to thank Sharda Srinivas and our director, you know, for, you know, bringing all of this together. Thank you, everyone. And, you know, I hope uh, all of you have a good rest of the week. And we'll see you very soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs>